Uh, welcome everyone. I would like to welcome everyone to Health for the World COVID question and answer session. Um, as many of you already know, Health for the World is our nonprofit initiative which promotes, which aims to promote health worldwide. Uh, we believe that every human being should have access to basic uh, health services worldwide. Uh, today, we have health, uh, healthcare professionals from around the world who have joined today for the session. And there are also healthcare professionals who, who will be uh, seeing this video later. Uh, and also through Facebook Live uh, because of our team member, Michael, who was able to arrange this. Um, we are united at this time to fight this pandemic and we will. Um, I'll start with introductions. Uh, I'm Dr. Bhavya Rehani. I am the president and co-founder of Health for the World and a faculty at UCSF. Uh, we have Dr. Ankur Parija, who's the co-founder of Health for the World and director of inpatient geriatrics at Stanford. We have Dr. Bill Dillon, who's the uh, Executive Vice Chair of Radiology at UCSF and co-founder of Health for the World. So now I would like to introduce our expert today. Our expert today is Dr. Peter Chin Hong. Uh, we are really delighted to have him. Um, Dr. Uh, Peter is, uh, uh, is a professor of infectious diseases and medicine at UCSF. He's frontline in treatment of COVID patients at UCSF. He's also a renowned medical educator and an inaugural holder of the Academy of Medical Educators Endowed Chair for Innovation and Teaching and has won numerous awards. Um, above all, Peter is a very nice human being and has um, really, uh, you know, helped UCSF fight COVID, has arranged and uh, led a PP drive for UCSF and is also helping us today with the session. So thank you, Peter, for doing this. And uh, I would let Dr. Barija uh, ask you questions after this. Uh, and as a format of the session, it's very simple. As we discussed, the questions have been submitted and Dr. Barija is going to address them. But, but if you have more questions, please feel uh, free to ask them uh, through the chat function uh, on Zoom. And you can also write your name and your country uh, so that we know a little bit more about you. Thank you so much. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you, Bhavya. Uh, Peter, uh, again, uh, thanks for taking our time. Uh, hopefully, um, uh, this is uh, a bit of self-care for you uh, as well as you uh, get out of rounds and uh, uh, isolation mode and see some faces. Totally. Not just uh, locally, but throughout the world. Uh, uh, we, we've got people from India, Bhutan, uh, Cameroon, uh, Rwanda, uh, Tanzania, and, and uh, Fiji, and others uh, apart from the United States as well. So. Uh, well, um, let's jump into uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, some of the questions we've gotten from, uh, in the, this past week. Uh, well, um, it sounds like you're coming right from the front lines. Uh, before we uh, get into the specifics, uh, can you speak in general a little bit about sort of what you've seen so far and, and sort of overarching thoughts? Uh, at UCSF. Yeah, so I'll talk about the clinical part first and then make a little nod to the systems just in general. I would say clinically, it's we haven't luckily seen as many cases as New York, but like they said with these public health measures, you know you're successful when you think, wow, I wonder if we should have even done it in the first place, you know, because nothing is happening. But that's the whole point. I think we're nervous here in California, but I feel like um, We've seen cases come in very steadily, but not on that surge. And I think that's exactly the what's flattening the curve is. It doesn't mean you wouldn't see cases, but they get spread out so that the hospital resources are in step with the number of patients coming in. So what we've seen so far is that people come in and they're very sick, but they don't leave. So every time someone comes in, they take up an ICU bed or vent, but they stay there and they don't really get discharged. So since I've been here, I don't think we've had any discharges from the ICU, and they just keep on coming in. It's not like New York, but it's steady. So at some point, you know, it's like when you keep the tap on and it's dripping, the faucet, but at some point it's gonna fill up the tub. And you think, wow, it's, you know, it's dripping so small, so slowly, but uh, if you don't watch out, it's gonna overflow the tub. I feel like that's the situation we're in. We're seeing young people and old people. Young people get sick too. But my sense is that the young people are not dying very quickly, luckily. But they've been supported on a ventilator for a long time. The older people, some of them, unfortunately, uh, die sooner. And they die very quickly. <clears throat> one other observation we've had is that people don't get very sick 
all of a sudden, it seems like you get sick and symptoms for maybe five to seven days. And then it all almost is like you fall off a cliff. It happens very, very suddenly. So I think what we've started to do is in people who have been, you know, they don't get the bar that they are on the floor. We always are very nervous to make sure at some point, day five or seven, that they you know, that we're on, on guard for that. So, you know, I can talk on and on for all of the features, but that's kind of the general impression. A sprinkling in the San Francisco area, all ages get sick. Um, they stay here for a long time. They haven't really been discharged. My sense is that the younger people will survive, but they are critically ill. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, and, and, and just a note on uh, symptoms uh, that people should suspect um, um, as they're at, in their homes or in the community. Yeah, so I had uh, one of my infectious disease friends from Emory, who you might know because of his work with Global Health, uh, Dr. Carlos Del Rio. He often says that uh, there are two things he does in the morning to do a check because he's also working a lot with COVID patients. Number one, does he have a fever? And then number two is an interesting question, which we're seeing emerge in the literature. Even this morning, a faculty member who has COVID texted me because he realized, he recognized that he wasn't tasting or smelling anymore. So that is actually one of the interesting early signs, apart from fever, is not being able to taste or smell. So those two things together, I think should make someone concerned. But of course, the usual symptoms that people t talk about, which is fever, shortness of breath, and cough. The cough can be dry or it can be full of phlegm. Those are the initial signs that we think of. And now I think we're adding not being able to taste and not being able to smell. Okay, yes, and osmia is, is uh, becoming uh, more and more common as, as we hear about clinical features. Um, uh, do you see, um, and there was a question around, how do you account for uh, sort of this widespread variability in outcomes, as you just sort of alluded to, older adults, uh, uh, you know, who may be asymptomatic to, uh, you know, the ones who just, you know, uh, go down very quickly. And, and likewise for younger adults, there's some, such a wide variability and that's adding to the uncertainty uh, mm -hmm. and the scare. Uh, can you talk a little about that? Great, so there's a, been a slight evolution in thinking and it's continuing to go on. In the beginning, when we looked at 3,000 cases from China, it seemed that age was the main predictor. So when you're over 80, it's almost like you have 16% uh, mortality, and then you cut it in half for every decade. So 16, then 8, 8% between 70 and 80, then 4% between uh, 60 and 70, and then 2% between 50 and 60. But of course, it's not as simple as that. So as the epidemic has moved on, We've added additional risk factors. I think right now we're thinking that cardiovascular disease is a big risk factor uh, that we're still trying to figure out exactly. Of course, you can get direct effects of the virus on the heart, but if you come into the, the illness with heart disease, we think that gives you poor reserves. So people are getting uh, cardiomyopathy, arrhythmias, uh, and so on. So those are, that's still being worked out. Uh, the, the, the second risk factor, of course, is uh, an immunocompromised state. Uh, that wasn't really well described in China except for cancer, but I think we're seeing a signal with uh, immunocompromised patients. Of course, there could be a, some people wonder if it's going to be a paradoxical uh, improvement because you are, you're suppressing the immune system, so maybe you're going to suppress the cytokine release storm, which is the main feature of how people die. So. Overall, though, I think it's not good to have immunosuppression, even though there's a theoretical uh, benefit of having a suppressed immune system because of the drugs you're taking. Um, but that is, but cancer is definitely a, another signal that we've been seeing. So, <clears throat> um, of course, there, there are minor ones after that that's still being understood, hypertension, diabetes, uh, comorbidities, and of course, male was one of the features seen in the Chinese data, but that, that was uh, really thought to be because it was associated with smoking. I'd say smoking is a independent risk factor for disease progression with an uh, increased odds of about 14, uh, odds ratio of about 14. So when patients or people in the community ask me, what can they do to help them uh, weather through this pandemic? I say, well, apart from the, the personal hygiene and infection control issues, 
if you're smoking or your friends are smoking, tell them to stop. Because we do know in the data so far that it's associated with disease progression. Okay. Uh, apart from patient characteristics, do you think it's something to do with the uh, uh, the inoculum, the amount of sort of exposure or duration of exposure uh, or a different strain of virus and, you know. Yeah, it's all a great question. So the ischial strain was something that was brought up early on when it was thought that maybe when it left China, it mutated and when it went to Italy, it seemed to be a lot worse. But I think people have looked at that more rigorously recently and they don't think it's anything too different. I mean, you can cherry back where the origins of the virus come from, for example, in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, Charles Drew and others say, can look at our area and say, well, this person actually got it from the Seattle area, or this one actually got it from China directly, and this one got it from Europe. But they all, from the body's perspective, they're all the same, which means that when we develop an immune response to it, we don't think that you, you will get it reinfected, which is kind of like a silver lining in all of this. So that's the issue about, um, uh, mutation, we think it's not going to happen appreciably. In terms of the question about inoculum, <clears throat> we think that it increases your chance of getting it, but it doesn't really increase your chance of being getting worse disease. I think the worst disease part we're still trying to work out, and we're also trying to work out how can we predict who's going to get bad and who's going to just recover from the beginning, and that's where you know, all of this artificial intelligence and machine learning with large numbers of data is gonna come in. But because of lack of testing, which we'll get to, we can't really use that data very well in the US because we don't have population data. So you're just looking at the sick people. How do you predict a sick person coming to the hospital getting sicker, which is not as practical a question as somebody, everybody in the community, who's gonna get sick and who doesn't get sick. And that's because we don't even know how many people in the community have it the denominator which uh, nobody knows we just know what we see yeah it's like basic epidemiology you know if you yeah. don't know the denominator you can't really understand the disease prevalence um can you uh talk a little bit about uh, testing now as as um as you uh, kind of were getting into it yeah so there were many reasons why the united states had a poor response to getting enough testing and I think it's a cautionary tale to other people in the world. Although I would think that because of our politics here, it would probably be easier for other people in the world to organize as a country to get testing. And what happened is early on in January, the WHO actually offered the US their own test, but the US in typical American fashion said, no, no, that's okay, thank you very much for the thought. We're gonna just make our own. So they tasked the CDC with making their own tests, but of course the test doesn't get made overnight. The WHO had used it, and this was a German test, I believe. There's also a Chinese test for, you know, since Wuhan, and they've had a lot of experience, um, and it worked just fine. But the US said, thanks very much, we'll do our own. In the meantime, they were having more problems than they thought, and the epidemic came much sooner than they thought. And the CDC, as you know from the media, had problems with quality control. So they send off a batch to the states and then they said, okay, just send them back because they're not really working. So then the FDA did a remarkable thing, which is said, okay, they didn't admit to any wrongdoing or missteps, but they said, okay, we'll give local labs the ability to do their own testing. But that means that you have to have COVID patients in every lab to do validation. And I remember those days, people in our labs were scrambling to find COVID patients because at that point, we didn't really have a lot. And you, um, so that was a delay as well. Then the local labs got up and running, but then we had a delay in the supply line. So something as easy as, you know, the swab that probably cost less than a dollar was in short supply because as the, most of those, first of all, come from outside the United States. And as the pandemic was in Asia, they restricted exports of these materials that they needed. Some of the swabs come from other parts, but it's the same as PPE. So we were getting fewer reagents and fewer swabs, even though we had the machines ready to run it. So it was just like a perfect storm of not taking the WHO test when they needed to, not realizing how fast the epidemic would come, and then delays in bringing up capacity in local labs, and then now a delay in supplies. 
So all of those things led to the fact that we're just using testing like it's a, like it's gold. Like, you know, we'll only give it to you if we think you're sick, which is silly for this audience because, you know, in HIV, we don't say we're only going to test you if you have PCB pneumonia or Kaposi sarcoma. We say, let's test everyone in the community. So if you know you have it, you can take measures to help protect other people in the community. It's weird that we're not doing that in COVID-19 in the U.S. We're just giving it out to the few, or the celebrities too. That's why celebrities in the U.S. were some of the first people to be known to have the disease because they were able to grease the wheels and get the test in typical American fashion, like, you know, Tom Hanks or um, NBA basketball players, even before people in the community. Well, is there, uh, there was a question around, is there um, sort of uh, an X amount of uh, percentage in the population uh, that has to come positive for us to know that uh, we're testing enough or, or how much is enough or, or there is Well, no that's answer. a great question because as people know, I'm very sophisticated because you don't have to sample every single person in the population. If you do, a, you know, if you do some probability sampling, you can just sort of sample um, intelligently to get a sense of what the general co uh, population is like. But, but um, we, ha we haven't even reached there yet because we're, again, being, we're using tests as react reactively, not proactively. So there aren't enough tests for epidemiologists to go and say, let's be sent thoughtful and do like a, a random test of like 15 to 25 year olds. And but what, what's also lost in the narrative in the US, I was talking to some colleagues last night actually from the American Black Cardiology Society. And they were saying, and we were talking about the epidemiology in the US and what's very lost is the voice of what's happening in the vulnerable populations and, and the non-white um, minorities because when you look at CDC data, it's not disaggregated. When you look at self, you know, people's movements, it's all clustered in the South where there's a large population of minorities. I mean, it's the way I told them it was, it was like an invisible epidemic, not unlike what HIV was when it first came out. When HIV first came out, it was just really a white disease in San Francisco and New York, but actually there was all of this happening in, invisibly in other populations. I think the same is going to happen with COVID-19 in the U.S. Okay. Well, uh, along the same lines, there is a question from Cameroon as we're speaking. Uh, uh, one of our collaborators, uh, Albert, uh, there asks, uh, have you, um, uh, do you think or have you seen cases in HIV infected patients? And, and yes, if, if the presentation is different or things they should be mindful for, especially talking about the population they're serving. That's a great question. Um, we haven't seen HIV. So I think there was one at San Francisco General. I have to talk to my colleagues, but we've seen more um, transplant patients now. Um, and they're similar in terms of a defect in T cell immunity. So I think we could make some generalization in terms of comparison. So far, the transplant patients are holding their own. They're not, they don't seem to like from, and again, I'm being anecdotal because we don't have a lot of data. But in my experience so far, they, the immunocompromised patients are not acting much different from the other population. Um, they look very similar. So I, I'm hopeful that if more HIV patients get it, that they actually won't have an extra risk of HIV infection. Of course, if they are on HIV medicines and ARTs, I would think of them as a patient very similar to a non-HIV infected patient. If, of course, if they're not on ARTs, have low T cells, I would worry a little bit about them. Just in terms of, I would think of it like if an HIV patient got bad influenza, how would they look? Um, so it depends on the T cells. But so far the transplant patients we're seeing, what they do is they drop the immunosuppression um, a, a little, as much as they can and, and sort of weather the storm. For HIV would mean mm -hmm you want to make sure the immune system is pretty robust going in to this, um, you know, if, if people are getting sick. Okay. Well, thanks for those uh, uh, input. Uh, let's uh, jump back to testing. Uh, how sensitive do you think is the current uh, sort of widely available test uh, just done through the nasopharyngeal swab? Okay. Uh, so that's a really great question. We don't know the full answer yet, but we are going 
these um, influenza swab data that we have a lot of in the community. And we think that a community swab will have a sensitivity of about 75%. But really, it's all about how hard you swab because it unfortunately has to hurt a little bit because you have to take the epithelial cells, which has the virus in it, and then put it in the, in the transport medium. So you have to get enough cells. So if you're just like going in and you're feeling a little shy because the person's saying, ouch, ouch, you kind of want them to say a little bit of ouch because you want to get the cells to then put in the solution and then send it. So that's been a limitation, I think. Um, Seattle is doing something very interesting, which is making these home kits. So they just send it to people's homes and then they pick it up after and then give them the test. I think ultimately that would be the way to go for community-based screening because you don't want people coming up to you or drive through, which is some, what some people have been doing now. So that's 75%. When you go into the hospital and you're sicker, we haven't really had, we've had almost practically speaking at UCSF 100% since 30, meaning that when we repeat the test, because we thought maybe we, it was a false negative, they've never been positive again so far. So every, every negative that we got was a true negative later on because we repeated them because we wondered whether or not it was sensitive enough. So you would, that makes sense from an infection perspective because the sicker you are, the more virus you have, so you can like just swab it there and you probably get it. That said, there are different strategies you can do to increase sensitivity. You can do a swab of both the nasopharynx and the oropharynx in the same swab and break it off. You could um, get a bronchial alveolar lavage, but we don't, haven't done that too much because that introduces risk to the healthcare provider when they're putting the bronchoscope in because of aerosol. So we've just been trying to stick with that. And so far it's been doing well. In Hong Kong, they've been using early morning sputum and they've had and saliva and they've been having really good success with that. So if anybody wants to talk to the Hong Kong group, uh, they've been doing something really good just with even something simpler. Um, in, the, in, the, in the night when you lie down, sort of like all of the secretions pool with the epithelium. And then in the morning, when you, if you cough that up, you can probably, you'll find virus there if, if you're infected. And it's probably a little bit more comfortable uh, for the patients. But we haven't used that in either. Do you think we, um, uh, we are close to having a reliable sort of point of care rapid test? Uh, there's also yeah, around ELISA testing, uh, how long before we have one of those tests? So it's already here, um, but it's just like strep testing. You will have some places having, and that leads to possible inequities too. So you have some people having access to a fancy machine to do get a test back in 15 minutes. You have some people who have to wait 12 hours, and then you have some people who have to wait 24 hours. So it just depends on what platform your institutions decided to invest in. Hours is still a little bit long in terms of time, and they're trying to get it down to three hours from so 12 hours. But there are places uh, where you can get it, like at Stanford, for 15 minutes now. I think uh, they're down to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we um, have, uh, well, another question around testing as we move on. The proper um, Technique for swabbing is probably one reason for variability, as, as you mm -hmm. mentioned. Uh, the average distance of nasopharynx is nine to ten centimeters from the nose. Yes, this is Dr. Bill Dillon, uh, our, our, our poor faculty founder, who's commenting that uh, it really speaks to uh, how deep you have one has to go in. Yeah, uh, it feels like you're giving the person pain. So that's why people feel a little bit squeamish about doing it. That's why actually sometimes self-collecting swabs are sometimes better because you don't see the squeamishness and you're doing it on yourself. So you could kind of, you know, judge yourself. It's, it'll be interesting to see what, because in self-collected influenza swabs, it's been promising. And of course, self-collecting STD screening has been something that's been going on for a while now. So sometimes the person doing it on themselves might, you know, get a better sample if instructed properly in the community, I, in the hospital, I think people use it because you just do it all the time, but not infrequently in the, if you're doing it infrequently in the community. Okay. Well, uh, let's jump into some management pearls as I know you've been really involved in uh, some of the uh, access to medications, et cetera, but uh, sort of, uh, can you provide some general overview of the management of these patients uh, that you've seen? 
Yeah, so the way I think about therapeutic management, I'll start with drugs first and then we'll talk about other things, uh, is that it's like the Olympics with a gold medal. There's a race and there's a gold medal winner, a silver medal winner, and a bronze medalist. So, so far in antiviral or therapeutic drugs, there there's no gold medalist in COVID-19 because we don't have randomized control data on anything. The silver medalist is probably the one that most people are uh, hopeful about. It's called remdesivir. It's a nucleoside analog. Uh, so it's similar to some of the HIV um, drugs, actually, but for COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. And uh, it's IV only. And Gilead is a drug company actually very close to Stanford and UCSF or Backdoor, where they developed it originally for Ebola, but um, you know, the Ebola epidemic went and it wasn't as helpful in Ebola, but it seems to be working really well for SARS-CoV-2 in the lab and in in vitro studies. And there's some anecdotes of patients getting better, but not any randomized control trials. So there are five trials going on around the world. WHO is doing one, NIH has one, Gilead has a few, and they're international studies. And UCSF is part of one um, where it's called an adaptive trial design. So we are studying remdesivir now, but as more drugs come in, we will use the same infrastructure to just add on drugs to study. So that's the most um, promising so far. So IV seems to be well tolerated, no side effects really. The other way to get that drug is through, originally through compassion use, but Gilead was overwhelmed with demand. So they shut that compassion use program down and they're going into a more controlled way of giving the drug, which is through an, what they call expanded access. And we thought originally when we were all not getting the, you know, when they stopped the compassion use that everybody will have, I thought it was going to be more equitable because I thought everyone was going to have access to expanded access. But actually it's been scary because they have been very secretive about it and only some people are being accepted and they're being strategic in who, who's being accepted. They want to be equitable, so they. But again, I'm, nobody knows their methodology. But they're trying to get centers that don't have access to a randomized control trial, trying to get centers who have a broad regional reach, um, trying to look at centers sometimes to take care of vulnerable patients. But then you have to have all the regulatory and compliance infrastructure in place. So I think that by itself might exclude some smaller places from getting it. So um, that's funded here, of course. People have heard about the bronze medals, which are hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. Chloroquine, known to many in this audience, uh, probably not as used that much in the United States. We have more hydroxychloroquine, which is used for rheumatoid arthritis and so on. So plaquenil is used very commonly by rheumatologists. They have very used to it. I'd say both of these drugs have cardiac toxicity. So when we use it in the hospital, for those people who can get trial drug, we always look at their QTC or AKG to make sure, because again, lack of good data, you always, it's always a risk benefit. If it was like, you know, a million times, we know for sure uh, increased odds of success, we would use it even in the places where that QTC was borderline. But because again, you, you have to always think how much data you have about this drug versus the risk it's gonna have in the patient. And I'm sure people in the audience have heard the stories of people like in Arizona drinking the aquarium cleaner because they looked and they saw chloroquine because the president had said something about chloroquine and everybody went out and bought it. They even went to Mexico to buy it. And then um, there's some cases in Africa where people got toxicity with drinking, uh, eating too much uh, chloroquine. So I think it's a drug that's uh, very, can be dangerous, but you know, if prescribed properly by a, a medical professional, it's safe. You know, we use it all the time for malaria and for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So it's just that it can be done in an unsupervised setting or with direction. So that's a bronze medalist. And then there are people who hadn't finished the race or who were disappointing. And that's like Kalitra um, because of the randomized control trial. But then the WHO is actually still studying Kalitra because they're wondering whether or not early on in disease it may have a benefit. Right, right now, people give gives drugs like in anything where there's a lot of people ill at the sickest, but actually in antivirals like with Tamiflu, we know that giving drug early on is much more beneficial because you stop the virus from moving and reproducing before it causes the damage. And the damage is a bad part for the body, not the virus itself. The virus is like 
happy, it's like jumping around in the mucus, and it's the immune cells that are causing the body to have disease, and that's the ARDS and all of that stuff. The virus is like there, it's like I'm not doing anything, but like all the immune cells are like coming and causing damage. And so if you want to stop the virus in its tracks early on, you can prevent the immune cells from being attracted to it. And that's the whole idea with early treatment. And that's why WHO said, well, maybe we won't give up on Kalitra. We'll just study it in early disease. So I, that's what's going on. And then there are a bunch of other drugs. I think in a pandemic situation, you can't develop new drugs because it takes about 10 years to develop a drug from scratch. So what you have to do is repurpose old drugs. So the way somebody described it to me, which I thought was a great analogy, is like you're teaching an old drug new tricks. So what they did at UCSF, for example, is they looked at the molecular structure of the virus and they looked at receptors all over the body that the virus might fit in and receptors that where we have drugs for already that block them. So they found 69 drugs that, and this was uh, reported in New York Times, of all drugs that may have some benefits. So right now they are looking in the test in the plates to see if the drugs on the plates will stop the virus and then they'll go on from there. So that's kind of another way of looking at what drugs uh, might be helpful in this uh, pandemic. And of course, people are looking at other things too. There's a study on colchicine and outpatients because it's easy to give. There's some biologic plausibility but of course, we're like in the early HIV days when people are trying lots of weird stuff like hydroxyurea and stuff like in the old days before someone actually develops a better antiviral. I think personally, until you develop, like I wouldn't expect colchicine to really do much or even hydroxychloroquine. I think that you really need an antiviral. Maybe remdesivir is the most promising thing so far. There's some other antivirals in Asia that uh, people have thrown around, but they haven't really risen to the top. I think... Um, until people look at some of those things. And, and ultimately, of course, the vaccine will be the best thing because people are going to get immune from the disease, but we don't know how long immunity would last. And this is not actually, many experts don't think COVID-19 is going to go away. It's going to have some seasonal variation. And then um, you'll define who, just like with hepatitis B, you can see who's been, who's been protected by antibody testing to decide who is safe to go and take care of COVID patients when it comes back again in the winter until we get vaccinated. So lots of interesting things. Actually, one of the most interesting therapeutic measures I think personally is the convalescent serum. So these are people who got COVID, maybe they got bad COVID, but they survived, or they got mild COVID and they want to donate their plasma. Then the blood bank here is and there's some all around the country doing this, just trying to make sure they have the COVID antibodies, enriching the plasma with COVID antibodies. And then the idea is if you infuse it early enough into a patient, it, again, it has the same effect. It neutralizes the virus before the body kind of gets excited and does all of the cytokine, cytokine storm. So I'm actually looking forward to um, convalescent serum. It also makes donors feel good too because you're again contributing to the care of others and just like you donate blood so i think that will be kind of an interesting uh development and they're doing it very rigorously and safe safely too and you think that would be sort of uh used as uh, as a treatment modality or as a vaccine sort of a that's, that's a great question i think ultimately in the beginning because so many people are dying they'll use it for treatment it probably wouldn't work that well the earlier you use it, the better it is. And ultimately, it would be kind of cool like you get IVIG. If you didn't get your Hep A vaccine to go abroad and you get IVIG, it might be the same where, well, this healthcare worker didn't get have COVID antibodies, but we really need that healthcare worker to go in to take care of these patients. So we're going to give them COVID-19 antibodies so to protect them when they go in to take care of that elderly patient who might get, you know, who has COVID and or ultimately, yeah, give the elderly co patient COVID um, before they get COVID, if there's an outbreak in the nursing home or something. Right, right. Oh, fascinating. I mean, uh, there's other question around uh, sort of something that's been on everyone's mind. Uh, how long do we think the immunity is going to last? I mean, uh, uh, can we, you know, yeah, I can guess. Can I think get COVID people, again? Yeah, based on what we know from other viruses, I think it will last... The sicker you are, the more robust your antibody response is. Actually, when we get coronaviruses call it causing colds, we don't much see much antibody response when people look at it. So 
usually the sicker you are and you survive, you're probably going to get more durable antibody response unless you're a transplant patient or something, a regular patient. If you're medium sick, like most people will be in the community or mildly sick, you will get one and we don't know how long it lasts. I'm, I think people are hoping that it just gets us through until it surges again in winter. Um, but, you know, no one can stay for sure. But, you know, I think it's a function really of how angry your immune system is in the beginning to what happens later on. And lower tract disease is going to be better than upper tract disease for waking up the immune system. Uh, we have another question which uh, asks why so far we don't have results uh, from the remdesivir trials from China and Italy. I think that's a great question. We have been wondering that ourselves because the Chinese have studied, finished their trial maybe a few weeks ago. And that itself is weird. People are saying, well, maybe they have a lot of data to look through, but you'd think they would have released the early trial data already. And so it's kind of surprising that they haven't in itself. So um, it's only speculation so far, but in the meantime, the U.S. is going through their own trials. It's actually, unfor well, fortunately for the trial, but unfortunately for people enrolling very quickly. So in maybe two or three weeks, it should all be done and we can get an answer very quickly. But the first answer will just be short-term outcomes, like 15 days, which probably won't be as meaningful because I told you most people are still in the ICU then. So as you get further along, maybe the curves will separate more and the 30 day difference will be better. And maybe the 15 days have will look similar with control and investigational drug. But as you go along, uh, maybe they'll, look, they'll diverge, but who, who can say? Okay. Um, well, and, and any guesses uh, for the timeline for the vaccine? Heard. Yeah, it's going to be at least a year. At least a year. So I think we have to, I think, speaking to George Rutherford, who is one of our epidemiologists who, in global health, people may know, he thinks it's going to be, this will be happening. We'll probably get over, it was shelter in place, et cetera, social distancing here in California, probably kind of quell it down. And then the, it'll be the work of public health to go into the community and stamp out the embers, you know, like little sparks from the fire. And that's going to be like from widespread community testing and so on. You, you identify people and you isolate them, quarantine them, and you stamp it out. But then the borders are porous, so people are going to come in and you may have resurgence uh, in that setting. Um, so just be, you'll have to be on guard using all these sort of like weird things before the vaccine comes for about 12 to 18 months. And then after that, you know, we probably have the vaccine. But people are working in it, but vaccine takes like 12 months at least. Uh, there was a follow up question around uh, uh, immunity and, and repeat COVID. Uh, have you heard of any reports from China on, on this issue? Repeat COVID, we have monkey studies so far where they uh, gave monkeys pneumonia with COVID and then they gave, then they waited a month and they gave the monkeys, infected the monkeys again, and none of them got it again. So we think that it's one thing, one virus, you get it again, you're not going to get sick. So that's the only good data we have so far. Uh, and it's only like five monkeys anyway, so that's the state of the art. But we think just biologically that yeah. most people who get it again, if you're successful with getting better, you're not going to get sick again um, in the beginning, at least for a few months. Well, again, it depends on how long your immunity lasts. Hopefully that's... They're close enough to humans. Yeah. <laughs> monkeys they pick. <laughs> yeah, I mean that was what they did for HIV early on too. They looked at, you know, those macaques right. as a for HIV models. And they were they were not bad actually. Um in treatment, um uh, now oh, there were questions around uh, if someone has uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, who is on a um, non-steroidal immunosuppressive yeah. drugs like leflunide, uh, methotrexate, sulfasilazine. Uh, uh, do you recommend decreasing the dose or stopping these immunosuppressive medications? No. Uh, I mean, I think of them as the lower tier of immunosuppression, so I think it's fine to continue them um, and not to change any management if they get sick. Of course, if, if you have a, the ability to 
decrease the dose without increase in symptoms of the patient. We always recommend that in infectious disease. So think about, is this the, is this the minimum dose the patient can have to stay comfortable? And if so, keep it going. Um, I worry about other kinds of immunosuppression at a higher level, like, you know, uh, sometimes when somebody has an organ rejection, we give them higher levels of T cell agents and, and so on. But um, we, for, the, for this class in rheumatoid arthritis, I think it's okay, as long as you, you make sure it's the, the right size dose for the patient to begin with. Okay. okay. And um, let's see. Um, I think um, there are questions around um, as ACE inhibitors, of course, uh, we've, we've uh, been hearing a lot about them and, and, and COVID oh, yeah. population. Should we stop? Should, yeah. should we not hold them in everyone? Um, your thoughts on that? Totally. So let's go back to some biology here in medicine. It's kind of interesting, right? So the whole thing with COVID is that it's looking for its landing spot, the landing pad. And the landing pad for COVID is the ACE2 receptor, which is the same thing that works with the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs. So there's a theoretical concern that when you saturate the ACE receptor, ACE2 receptors with drug, that the body in a response will make more of them. So the rebound hyper, uh, you know, production of other receptors when you block some is what people think theoretically could make COVID-19 worse because then you have more receptors. If you didn't take the ACE, you'd have like the normal number of receptors because you stimulate it in a feedback mechanism, production of more receptors when you block the ones with the drug, then the COVID-19 will find more places to land and then make the lung disease worse. So that's a theoretical concern. In reality, nobody knows. So the WHO, the kidney societies, the heart cardiology societies all tell people, don't do anything different. We don't have any evidence and don't change anything for patients one way or the other. I think personally changing things when we don't have evidence makes the community have more anxiety. And so my style is always to just keep going until there's a strong reason to do something different. And that happened with ibuprofen and WHO that everyone was surprised about. Because yeah. as people re remember it about a week or so ago, WHO made this weird recommendation of not using ibuprofen and maybe using paracetamol or Tylenol instead. But that was based on fake news. And I think everyone was disappointed that they were able, that they said that without really looking at the evidence. And then the next day they reversed their statement and said, actually it's okay, forget I said that. But I think that just led everyone to feel a little bit more uncertain about the science and COVID. And I think that's why people are so confused in the community because they, the president is saying one thing that's not science-based. Even WHO made a mistake because that was based on the French minister who tweeted on the Sunday before that, I'm worried about ibuprofen. But that French minister got it from a WhatsApp fake news when they said it was somebody from Ireland. And the person from Ireland said, that wasn't me. And then the Infectious Disease Society of Ireland said, took it down. There's a nice BBC report on how the whole thing happened. It was really amazing. And then, then the WHO reversed and said, okay, forget it, ibuprofen is okay. But in the meantime, the community were already confused. And I knew providers at UCSF that were telling patients to stop taking ibuprofen. And in fact, in New York, I heard from colleagues that you can't even get Tylenol anymore because everyone raided them because they were afraid of using ibuprofen. But I like ibuprofen, so I continue to use it. And I have more headaches during COVID-19 anyway. Uh, OK. Uh, there are a few <laughs> questions from the audience. And I think, uh, let me ask that because uh, people are keen to know the answers. So from Cameroon, we heard that uh, Cameroon said that we recorded our first health personal death from COVID-19 in Cameroon. Can you please talk about the rate of transmission if it has been documented from patients to healthcare professionals? Well, that's a great question. So right now we think that most healthcare providers, we don't have great evidence, but right, I'll give you the evidence we do have. Mm -hmm. So right now we have good evidence that most people who, or some evidence that people who actually get it, the first few healthcare workers who got it at UCSF, they actually got it from the community, not from UCSF. But nevertheless, we started, you know, universal mass policy here at UCSF. And in Singapore, 
probably the best data is in Singapore when um, healthcare workers use just regular surgical masks. And even though there were COVID-19 patients going around, none of them who used the mask got infected. So again, it's all about PPE, but you don't have to have fancy N95 PPE, just a regular surgical mask will do because again, it's droplet spread unless you're using bronchoscopy or intubation, but this is fine for most extent instances. Plus the N95 is actually kind of hard to wear. It's very suffocating. Like you can't even breathe for a long time. So I think actually in a paradoxical way, if you wear an N95 all day long, you want to be taking it off to like breathe. Um, right. So this is actually, you can, I can actually wear this all day long. It's actually kind of comfortable. So in Singapore, that data shows that if you do even that minimum uh, intervention, you wouldn't get any transmissions even from known COVID-19 patients. Right. That's and the first thing, so yeah. And, and Peter, there's also a question about, you know, lack of PPE, you know, and then people are using cloth masks. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you think about that? So I think of all of the protection in terms of, of risk reduction rather than absolute <laughs> risk. Of course, there's people, you can be anxious about COVID-19 if you wanted to. A lot of people are anxious in the community now about the fact that some lab found it in the vent or like maybe you find it in the air. But to me, so what? I mean, you don't give a statin for a heart, heart disease to say, you take the statin and you will not get a heart attack. This is like golden. We give it for risk reduction. We give it to decrease your risk a lot, but not absolutely. So the way I think about PPE is based on how the virus actually works, which is droplet, and it falls within three feet. And yeah. a cloth mask will actually stop the droplet before it hits there. Of course, it's not gonna be as great as a high grade surgical mask, right. but it's gonna give you a lot of protection. It's much better than exposing yourself to the environment, particularly in the community when people have crowded, uh, you know, public transportation, or you're going to the grocery, you can't <coughs> control your environment and social distance. So it's really important. So cloth masks, bandanas, I've had with some patients ask me about their religious wear. Actually, it is, I think it's a good thing when, you know, if yeah. they have that, because it will, protect, it will trap the droplet before it gets in and reduce yeah. the risk substantially. And if you want to get, if you want me to give a number, I'd probably say in the 75 to 80, almost 90% range. It depends on the inoculum. So pretty, pretty um, decent. That's great. That's great. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Namka Dorji from Bhutan. He said, uh, is there any data about uh, uh, the COVID-19 mothers breastfeeding and transmitting the virus to, to the babies? Yeah, so right now we don't think there's going to be any risk of <coughs> the breast milk lactation. Like there's no blood-borne risk. Um, that's because it's really tradition. It's kind of old fashioned virus in, in its nature, even though people have given it this like sort of movie star like thing because everyone's afraid of it. But it's just like the way you get a cold, you, you cough on somebody and the virus is on the drop is very lazy. So it's going to drop if it's not there, but it's trying to find the promised land and the promised land for the virus is your nose and your mouth. So in a, in a breastfeeding baby, the main risk would actually be in the mom actually uh, who maybe the mom is not being wearing a mask and has COVID-19 and then introducing it into the nose or the mouth of the baby, but not through the breast milk. Right, right. Um, that's a great answer. And then Peter, there's a question again from Cameroon about if one member of the family has the disease, what is the chance yeah. of transmission to the rest of the family members? I think there's a high chance unless you do certain features. So some, there are things people can do. Um, of course, you when and it's a big deal as more people in the community get COVID-19, all of us would be caretakers of somebody because you can't not take care of your grandmom or your aunt or your mom. So I think if you're not infected before and they are infected, there, there are things that you can do. A mask for both um, while you're close, um, washing your hands a lot. So I think over the four S's, well, so the first S is sanitize. So you sanitize your hands wash it 20 seconds or sanitizer. The second S is surfaces. So when you're taking care of a loved one with COVID, you want to make sure the surfaces are clean as much as you can. Don't go crazy. Just regular detergent will open up that lipid outside of the virus. So it's fine. Um, the, third, the third S is social distance. So when you, if you're not wearing a mask, you have to stay at least six feet away from the person. If you want to get close, use a cloth mask or, <clears throat> or a mask. Um, to protect yourself or the patient or the family member. 
And then the fourth, the fourth S is to sustain. So it's easy to slack off, but you just have to keep on going and remember all of these things as the epidemic goes on. Okay, that, that's great. But and uh, a question regarding healthcare professionals returning home after work. How do they prevent transmission? Yeah. I think it's a forest, so, as you said. Yeah, yes. and, but healthcare providers, when talking to them, this is not published anyway, have done different things based on their situation. I know people, for example, who go in a different room, take off their old clothes from the hospital, put on new clothes, take a shower, and, and then meet the family. You, because your body is a surface, so you can clean the surface before meeting the family. Right. Other people keep a clothes in the trunk of their car, <coughs> they would change it. Or some people, right now in the hospital, they open up the showers in the gym. So actually, one thing I've been thinking about myself is just taking my, cleaning my surface here before I go home. So mm -hmm. I can take a shower in the hospital, put on new scrubs, and then go home, and then I feel fine. The other surface that people are worried about is the shoes too, because those are, you know, you're walking around and we know the virus can live for a few days on hard surfaces. So that's, you know, people are very, want to do the best they can. Again, it's risk reduction. You can't reduce all the risk, but you just want to do the best you can. And then the last thing people have done is in more extreme measures, they've sent the small kids to live with the grandparents for the mm -hmm. way. So the kids don't become the vector to then make the older people sick. Right, right. Uh, we have grandparents, so I think they'll be happy to hear that. <laughs> All right, so uh, a question from Brent um, Copes. Uh, there seems to be an excessive amount of fear in the public right now. For example, people buying large amount of toilet paper. Um, how can we as healthcare providers properly educate the public to have a healthy sense of a paranoia and minimize the anxiety level uh, that's going on in the public? What I've, That's a great question. What I've found personally is that teaching people basics, the basics of how it's transmitted makes everyone feel very um, at ease because the messaging is lost, I think, in the public health, at least in the US, because <coughs> we tell people you have to do all these things. You have to clean the surfaces and you have to stay away from people and you have to wear a mask maybe and you have to uh, do all these things. Um, it feels confusing and maybe I think in my situation at home, I, how can I stay six feet away from someone? I'm living nine people in the same room. So I think what that leads to is just like either I'm not going to take any of these rec recognitions or it doesn't apply to me or I'm just confused because I can't go out and buy expensive cleaners and all that stuff. So, but it really comes down to one thing, I think, which is lost, which is, again, the virus is trying to go from someone's nose or mouth to your nose or mouth. So if you just stop that pathway and you, and you don't touch your nose or mouth because it's trying to get there by washing your hands, that's probably the easiest thing to do. Mm -hmm. and communicate with people. I think what has happened is fear and anxiety has led to anger and mm -hmm. anger leads to stigma and violence. So that's what we've been seeing in the Asian Americans and in the US right now because of the president's use of the word Chinese virus and and more than him. And they've been in San Francisco alone. I learned yesterday something ridiculous like 1200 uh, reports of hate crimes against um, uh, Asian Americans in the last two weeks. So very surprising to a lot of people. And most of the hate crimes involve spitting mm -hmm. or coughing on someone, which you can imagine is actually quite dangerous if you're thinking about transmission or infection. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty sad. You know, we are like a global family here and we are all make of, made of the same material and this doesn't make sense. All these the virus doesn't care who you are. Exactly. You know, so that, that's, that's pretty sad. Um, Peter, one question from Dr. Albert Nyanga. Uh, have you seen young adults with critical illness who have no other comorbidities? Oh, yes. Yes, we've seen it. In fact, the first patient I took care of was a 40-year-old um, who had no past medical history, no, nothing ever wrong. Um, he, he had two weeks of <laughs> symptoms, didn't go to the doctor, then crashed very suddenly, like we described. It's almost like you're falling off a cliff. Went, was intubated, went to the ICU. And um, he's, he's getting better now. So that's, he, his story is like the story of young people who get sick for me, they actually will get better. But it's the older people who get really sick, they don't get better. Right, right. okay. And I think, uh, uh, Peter, it's 8 a.m. so we have to wrap up. Um, but I think we can uh, 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 end with a positive story which you have 
uh, heard during this time of COVID, either a healthcare provider or a patient story, which is inspiring uh, to everyone for our audience globally? Yeah, so I think what has been remarkable to me is how people have rallied together in, in community during COVID. And um, to me, you know, what I was reflecting on is the work of the medical students here. And um, I think sometimes hospitals are very shy, particularly in the US to say that they don't have enough of something because they feel like they should be the parent and provide for the employees, particularly something you know, like a mask. So when at UCSF we heard that we um, were running out and the CDC was saying, use a bandana if you don't have a mask, I, we got all really alarmed and so we didn't have much time, so we activated the medical students and they did amazing work. So I think what's been known is that they went out in the community and got like almost 20,000 masks, but they also looked at small businesses. They wrote more than a hundred small businesses, personal letters like Sherwin Williams in San Francisco and they gave masks. Then they even talked to multinational corporations in China and South Korea to see if they can get bigger amounts of mass. So I, 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 and then they were multiply effects. So whenever you do, you see something good in the rest of the country, other people want to do it too. So they inspired other people to do it. So I think just being that volunteerism that came out in, in COVID-19 has been something that I've been seeing time and time again. And the med students are also very aware of, of wanting to be equitable. So they didn't, at, eventually UCSF got a big donation from you know, somebody else, but they, they still did, did the drive because they wanted to divert it to places that didn't have it, like smaller hospitals or clinics that didn't have a voice. And uh, like even yesterday, some med student asked me, you know, we're focusing on small clinics now in Santa Clara Valley because of um, the surge there. Do you know of any smaller clinics in the area that still don't have any? So because at the end of the day, people are like giving me these secret messages because some employees actually don't want their employees don't want their employees to go public about not having masks. They're still very sensitive about it. So there were people going through the grapevine of telling me us when they were short. So the medicines were diverting it and doing it kind of secretly. But it was just really amazing to see. So that I'll end on on that that note that um, you know I I will always remember what they did um, during this time and how they saved the hustle. UCSF will never say that publicly. And maybe I'll get in trouble because it's going to be recorded, but the <laughs> students saved UCSF because they maybe had two days left. And then they went out and filled it acutely. Even though donors came in later on, they wouldn't have gotten it fast enough. And it would have demoralized healthcare workers at that time if something wasn't done. Yeah, this is, that's a very beautiful story. Uh, one of our uh, volunteers, he's a medical student at UCSF, Francis Wright. Yeah. He was telling me the inspiring story of how the medical students got together to do this. And as you said, they wanted to diversify it and help as many people as possible. Um, I think with that note, uh, we are going to uh, end this question and answer session. Peter, I really am very thankful to you for doing this for us. I know you are working in the COVID ward right now and still could take our time to do this. So we really appreciate you doing this for us. And this was... Uh, uh, you know, your breadth of knowledge is excellent, and this is really helpful. Uh, I would like to, uh, you know, thank all the doctors and nurses from our, around the world who have joined for this session. Uh, thanks for doing that. Um, uh, I would like to thank on behalf of myself, Dr. Ankur Bharija, uh, who did a great job moderating, and Dr. Bill Dillon, who's uh, also the, who's the co-founder of Health for the World and the Executive Vice Chair of Radiology at UCSF. Um, thank you so much, and uh, everyone have a great day. We are going to fight this pandemic. We are going to get through this together as a global family. We'll keep our hopes high, and um, um, we will fight fear with courage. So we're going to get through this. Thank you, everyone, for joining today, and thank you again, Peter. This was this was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.